I want to talk to you about the second coming of Christ. I want to read a scripture from Matthew chapter 24. Most of the 24th chapter is speaking about an event that will take place soon. This was Jesus. This was thousands of years ago. And he mentions in this chapter about several events that would take place within probably about um, within the next 40 years or less. And he puts the timeline for this event to take place. He says, when he was talking to the disciples in the 24th chapter of Matthew, he said, this generation, generation is 40 years, will not pass away until these things be fulfilled. Most of chapter 24 was fulfilled in 70 A.D. Mistakes a lot of preachers, teachers make is trying to take something that's already been fulfilled and cast it into the future. One of the scriptures that are, is often abused today is found in verse 6 and 7. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that ye be not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And this was thousands of years ago. And then he said, For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and diverse places. But the end is not yet. Those things happened and took place. Then one of the things he talked about, he predicted in the future that this temple and the city would be destroyed. 70 A.D., it happened. Now, one of the things he talks about here in 24 that is definitely in the future, has not happened, was the second coming. What I try not to do is try to make predictions concerning the second coming based on what is happening in the nation of Israel and the rest of the world. I look at trying to understand the future based on two important factors, Christ and his church. That's the filter, that's the presupposition that I have in my life that I try to understand end time events based on not the nation of Israel, but Christ and his church. He's coming back for a bride without spot, wrinkle, blemish, and that bride is composed composed of neither Jews or Gentiles, male or female, bond or free. When you come to Jesus, you take on his identity. Not your identity based on Hebraic roots, but you take your identity based on Jesus Christ. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's what we're looking at. Amen? He's coming back with a mature bride. Amen? So in my introduction, I mentioned three major things. Maybe there's more, but there's three things I see very clearly in the Bible. And for the timeline, I have no idea or exactly when we hit this point or this place that these things have come to their climax. The first thing, it says in Matthew 24, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end shall come. Now, when that happens, I don't know, and I'm sure you don't know. But at some point in time, God says, it's done, that's fulfilled, and now I'm coming. The other thing I mentioned here is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. It's coming back for a glorious church. The church is not united. The church is not matured. The church, when we look at the church worldwide, is still fighting amongst themselves. And God is coming back not for a little child or an older person. He's coming back for a person who's mature. The church is at that level of maturity. Who knows? And when that happens, it's only in the heart and mind of God when he sees that being fulfilled. Amen? So, 
I want to, in my day and time, as the pastor of this church, to say we're not competing or, com- or, com- or comparing ourselves to other churches. We join with other churches. We believe that we're a church without walls. There's only one church in Cherokee County. That's the Church of Jesus Christ. Amen? So we had a National Day of Prayer this past week. I was there embracing my friend Mark Lawson from Northgate Church. Went over and gave Johnny Hunt a big hug from First Baptist Church. Len Einan from Woodstock Christian Church. Also, um, Julie Crawford from Spring Church and different pastor friends of mine from other churches, I'm not comparing and competing with them, working with them, amen? And I think they have the same mindset. Now, everybody doesn't, but I can't help them, but I know what I'm going to do. I know what you're going to do, amen? And when we come together in eternity, there won't be the Baptists and the Methodists and the non-denominationals. We'll be one body, a one believer, Amen? all join together. There won't be any ethnic group here or there or this color or that color or this language or that language. We'll all be speaking the same language. I don't know what language that is. Amen? But it'll be whatever God chooses. Probably won't be English or Russian. We won't be saying, Slava Boho, you douja malanki. You know? <laughs> And I just take words that don't make sense. They just sound good. <laughs> and another event that shall take place before the return of Christ, found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, that she, they shall not come except there be a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So actually put this in order, okay? The gospel kingdom preached a falling away, a glorious church. Amen? Before the church comes to a place of maturity, God's going to do a house cleaning. Bless you. Gungerschnitz, all that other good stuff. So, you know, I think, oh, my goodness, a falling away. Oh, no. As a preacher, you want a gathering in, not a falling away. Someone said to me one time, I'll tell you what a real move of God is. Take a church of 1,000, preach it down to 300. That's a move of God. Well, that seems to be what God says before the end comes. There's going to be a falling away because he says, if there's a tree that's not producing fruit, cut it down and throw it in the fire. Now, that seems kind of hard to me. Seems kind of rough. He says, if there's a tree, if there's a church, if there's a ministry that's not producing fruit, it encumbereth the ground. Pluck it up and toss it to the wayside and plant something there to bring forth fruit. He says there's true prophets and false prophets. He says, by your fruit you shall know them. He tells us, if we abide him, he abides in us, we shall bring forth much fruit. What is fruit? Fruit is two things. Fruit is you develop the character of Jesus Christ, you take on more of the likeness of Christ and the likeness of yourself fruit of love and joy and kindness and gentleness and temperance. And the list goes on, the fruit of the Spirit. Seven different things. Also, fruit is you reproduce yourself in Christ. When one person comes to God, it says the, heav- the angels in heaven rejoice. Rescue those who are perishing. Amen? Some of you plant seed. Some of you water the seed. Some of you turn up the soil so that it can have more nutrition and life to the plant. But God is the one who brings the increase. Amen? We depend on God. I can't save anyone. I can't heal anyone. I can't deliver them. I can't make signs, wonders, and miracles happen. That's the God stuff. Amen? But what we're to do is position ourselves. We embrace the presence of God. Do what God calls us to do because He's the one to receive the glory, not me, not you. He received the glory. Can you say amen? Now, what I want to talk about today is this falling away. Roman number two. In the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, 
It says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, if filling in the blanks, and that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Then he says in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 2, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devil, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Hopefully, no one falls in that place, but some people will. I've seen some people who had an unfortunate event in their life. I knew of a, a man I ministered to years ago who was in Vietnam, and I don't know if he killed a friend or someone else, but it so messed up his mind that he became hard towards God. It seemed like his conscience was seared, that a hot iron had been taken and just impregnated into the inner core of his being where his conscience was the fact that he could discern good from evil. And when he heard the gospel, when he heard about God, he was, ah, I have no place for God. I blame God for the unfortunate thing that took place in my life. And became hard and callous. It wasn't that the Spirit of God wasn't moving and reaching out to him, that a wall just came up. For some reason, in God's sovereignty, in God who is in control of everything, allows there to be a space for human responsibility, a thing called choice. And as I have taught before, the sovereignty of God and human responsibility or free will or choice, there's a balance that God does require us to respond to his moving by faith and say, God, I believe. If we believe, all things are possible. Amen? There are some things I don't understand and cannot give you a good explanation for what happens. Bad things do happen to good people, but I know that God can empower us to deal with unfortunate bad things in our life that we look hard enough we can see a redeeming element there and we can come out of the ashes of destruction and disappointment and hurt and pain and go on and know that the best is yet to come. Can you say amen? But the truth is right here in the word of God. Before Christ returns, there's a falling away because people buy into a form of secular humanism or postmodernism or fall into some form of where people say one thing and behave another way and come along and say, you can love Jesus and serve God. He cares for you, loves you, and then you go out there and act like the worst of sinners. As saying one thing and living another thing, that's a form of hypocrisy. And there are people in the church today who are falling away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel, what in the world is the gospel? It's the good news. The gospel is Christ and the life he lived. The gospel is he was crucified on a cross he was buried, but he did not stay in the grave. He came out of the grave, overcame death, overcame the stronghold of sin, the grave, and gave us the power to not live a sinful life, a rebellious life, but the power to live a godly, holy life. Amen? For you to come to Christ, the gospel is real clear. You must deny yourself take up your cross, hate your mother, hate your father, hate your wife, hate your husband, hate your children. <laughs> you look at that. Am I reading the Bible? What? Hate sin, hate dirt. You look at me. Now I got your attention. Now let me explain it to you. All right? What it means in preaching the gospel there must be an exchange. You die so you can live. 
When you die, you give up all your passion, all your desire for anything and everything, and you make God first and foremost. When you make God first and foremost in your life as a believer, then you can love your husband. Then you can truly love your wife. Then you can truly love your children. Then you can truly love your mother and father. For God is love. For you to have agape love, I'm not talking about brotherly love. I'm not talking about, ooh, he's so sweet. She's so pretty, infatuation love. I'm talking about agape love, the God love. So what God's saying is, for you have to defer others and prefer me over them. The fact that I love God more than I love Dinah allows me to really love her as Christ loved me and gave his life for me. So it doesn't mean I don't love her. It doesn't mean I hate her because I love Jesus. What I'm saying, when you read that in the King's English, it does use those words, those strong words. But essentially, if I'm going to really love you, I've got to have the love of God in me. Amen? So what, what he's saying here. And, and denying yourself, take them to your cross, that means we step out of the way and let God get in the way. Amen? And then I can really love others because I do it with the love and power of God Almighty. Meaning, if someone comes against my wife, comes against my son-in-laws, my daughters, my grandchildren, members of my church, I believe God would give me the grace that I could easily lay down my life for you. I could say, I'll take the bullet. Let them live, let me die. I've lived my life. I lived more than half my life. I lived three-fourths of my life. I know that my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen? And not saying that, well, if I was 30 years old, I couldn't do this. What I'm saying is when it comes to life and death situation, the only way you can do the godly thing is that God gives you grace, gives you power to do what's written in this book. Amen? I've seen that happen in my life when I was in harm's way, but I put myself in the arms of God and knew that I could take any pain or suffering or any bullet or whatever and know that I was secure in what I was doing, that this was the right thing and the godly thing to do. Amen? Now, that's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is the good news that God has planned eternity for us, and this life is just a drop in the ocean compared to forever. Amen? Boy, I don't see any, any smiles. <laughs> I don't see... <laughs> he didn't say, you're going to have a positive middle attitude. You're all going to be millionaires. You're going to live in, a, in France in the summertime. You're going to live in Alaska in the wintertime. Turn that around. I... <laughs> All going to go to Hawaii, hallelujah, amen. How many want to join the church? Y'all going to Hawaii, hallelujah, we join the church, glory. I come up and say, no, you got to die to live. You got to hate everybody, you know, no, no. <laughs> How many understand what I'm saying? Raise your hand. All right, let me see whose hand's not up. I had to pray for Sarah, pray for Claire. Who else, let's see, uh, who else, who else ain't got their hand up? I got to pray for mom, Sheila, Rachel. Oh, my goodness. All these years. All these. <laughs> Here, raise your hand. <laughs> All right. Let's get through with this. Amen. <laughs> Number three. See if I can stay on tune here. The falling away has already began. Already begun. Excuse me, Diana. I, had, I hated English. I hated literature. 
I was a C student. And my professor one day said to me, there's going to be more C students serving God than there is A, you know, because there are not that many A students in this class, you know. I said, thank you, Lord. I know I've been redeemed. Oh, I remember having in college a class in literature, and they read a poem. What does that mean? Doesn't mean a thing to me. Doesn't mean a thing to me. Doesn't make any sense. I don't see anyone making a dollar out of writing poetry. Anyways, back to the message. <laughs> How many ever heard of Steve Hill? Raise your hand. Steve Hill was a drug addict. And back in the uh, 1970s, he ended up in Teen Challenge, and his life was transformed. He found Jesus, and he was set free. And he was mentored by the founder of Teen Challenge, Dave Wilkerson, who passed away a couple years ago. Steve Hill became a well-known evangelist. Primarily, he got his notoriety at the Brownsville Revival that started in Father's Day of 1995, I believe it was, and went on for five years. And he was, uh, along with the pastor, John Kilpatrick, of that move of God, he was an evangelist. And I think it was a year ago, maybe two years ago, he was on his deathbed. He had cancer, and he was told he's had, he was going to check out. And it looked like, he was gone. And then God intervened and miraculously healed this man from cancer. I mean, he was just about dead. And God brought him back to life. And recently, he's written a book called The Spiritual Avalanche. He uses this uh, illustration of a, an avalanche on a ski slope to illustrate what's happening in the church. He says there's a spiritual avalanche that's taking place within the church today. And he said there are seven deceitful, false doctrines or heresies that are being taught in the church today, predominantly in America, probably elsewhere. But to me, when I read this book, I realized that this is fulfilling what we read about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, and also in 1 Timothy, where it talks about before the return of Christ, there's going to be a falling away, Well, meaning that people must be in the way to fall out of the way, and most of the attack of the enemy is taking place in the church. Most of the circle letters written to correct false doctrines and heresies that we see in uh, the times at the church of Ephesus, at the church of Philadelphia, at the church of Smyrna, at the church of Jerusalem, all that, was that when you have wheat, the enemy comes in and sears, sows tares amongst the wheat, and you can't really tell who's real and who's not real. What a, if, if this is wheat or if this is a tear, and God says, leave it alone, at the end of time, I'll separate the sheep from the goat, the wheat from the tares. God is a righteous judge. Man cannot look into the inward heart of a person. I can't look into your heart and say, I know exactly what you think and what you believe. Only God can do that. First Samuel tells us man always judges on the outward appearance. Yes, God will give us discernment concerning what is truth and what is false as we hear things, read things, but I can't tell exactly what's in the heart and life of a believer. At the end time, God will say, sheep on this side, goats on this side. And then there'll be some goats or some tares that say, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we do this and that? And he'll turn and say, I don't know you, you worker iniquity, depart from me. God is the righteous judge. No one can pull the wool over God's eyes in this life or the life hereafter. I only get up and say, well, I went to church. I paid my tithes and offerings. I did this and that. I don't know you. You might know me, but I don't know you. What's important, I say this often, it's not if we say we know him, does he know us? Amen? Now, 
When you become a believer in Christ Jesus, if you're a new believer or been around for a long time, I believe this. The Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you belong to him every single day. We might have ups and downs. We might have questions in our lives. But down deep in your heart and life, if you belong to him, he's going to be saying, you belong to me. And when you step out of the way, he's going to come back and grab you by the nap of your neck and bring you back in the way. You might slip, you might fall, you might make a bad choice or a bad judgment, but God loves you. If he loves you, he will chasten you and bring you in the straight and narrow. Amen? So I get up and say, God, I'm totally dependent on you. I ask that you keep me, that you keep my eyes on you, that my heart is straight and right with you that I'll not veer to the left or to the right, but I'll stay, on the, I'll stay on the straight and narrow and walk with you each and every day. Amen? I believe that God's begun this good work in you, and he will complete it. Amen? How many people want to do right? Raise your hand. Hallelujah. See, you want to do the right thing. How many are secure in God that when you take your last breath that you will enter in the presence of God? Raise your hand. Very good. Now, I want to go through seven things very quickly to give you some warning that you'll not fall to any deception, that you'll not participate in anything that's not of him, that's not of Jesus. Amen? Did you see that this garbage is being presented in the church? You say, I'm not going to have any part of that. I am part of the remnant. Amen? God has always had a remnant in the day of Elijah. He said, Lord, I'm the only one who loves you and serves you. And you got this woman chasing me named Jezebel. Help me. And God said, I got good news for you. I got 7,000 others who haven't bowed their knee. God has always had a remnant. Even when he destroyed the earth with the flood, he had a remnant. I don't know how many people died then, but I know there are eight that remained. God is not in the numbers. He's in the righteousness. Amen? Jesus wasn't in the numbers. We think, oh, he's successful. Look at all the people that come to this church. He got thousands of them. God is not in the numbers. Like we say this is what's successful based on numbers and budgets and things. Jesus left his whole work in the hands of 11 disciples, and then they voted to bring another one in because of Judas Iscariot, who was on the team, was a betrayer. Was Jesus successful? Yes. Was it based on numbers? No. God's always had a remnant. Now, here's what I believe. As I read the book of Revelation, it says before the throne of God, I think it's in chapter 7, chapter 11 of Revelation, he says there was a number of people before the throne worshiping and praising him which could not be numbered. So God goes back and he starts at the beginning of time with Adam and then moves forward in time. Salvation is by grace through faith. He talks about justification by faith in the Old Testament, in Habakkuk. He talks about it in the New Testament. People before Christ look to the cross. People after the cross look back to the cross. We don't look to the cross. We look back to the cross. But we're connected by our faith that God gives us to believe and trust him for the gift of eternal salvation. Amen? And so, there is a number that could be... How many people are alive on the planet today? How many billion of people? Six billion? Six and a half billion? Something like that? Spirit of God moves. The glory of the Lord covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. And God, within a nanosecond, through the power of the Holy Spirit, could reap a tremendous harvest at this day and time. Amen? But regardless of what transpires, I want to keep myself 
on track with God, and you do too. Amen? The first false teaching in the church today is the carnal prosperity message. They'll say this, the prosperity teachers. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 11 through 13, tells us that God wants us to be blessed and do well, but not to the point of money possessing us. God wants you to do well. He wants you to prosper. But we're not in it for money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself is the medium of exchange. It's not good or bad, but it's what you do with it. You can take money and do something good with it or do something evil with it, or if you're not careful as a believer, your money can possess you. I've known people in the past who bought into the prosperity message, and they felt that they weren't successful unless they drove a Mercedes. Had a lady in the church years ago, was believing God, she needed transportation, found her a nice Buick, a used Buick. I don't want that. I asked God for Mercedes. She would not take the Buick, and she demanded, God, I want a Mercedes. Guess what? She never got the Mercedes, so she wasn't blessed. I want to be rich towards God. I want a wife and children who love Jesus. I want my daughters, their husbands, my grandchildren, all to know Jesus. I want everyone my church to know Jesus and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? I want to have the health of God in my body until the day I die. I want the presence of God in my life. I want to be able to hear the voice of God. I want to be able to experience the presence of God. Amen? I want to be able to know that uh, no matter what comes forth in my life, nothing can knock me off the straight and narrow that I walk with the Lord, no matter if it's trials, tribulation, whatever, that I am going to walk with Jesus. That, to me, is wealth. Amen? I'm a rich man, you're a rich man, not because of what we possess materially, but what we have spiritually. Amen? Because when you die, when I die, what are you going to take with you? Only what you have in Jesus. Amen? Jesus said this, Beware of covetousness, beware of greed, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things which he possesses. Don't say, God, I want to start this business. I'll tell you what. You bless me, I'll give you 50%. If you're smart, you say, God, you own all the cattle on the thousand hill, all the gold and silver. It's yours. We are just stewards going through this life. Some of us live in bigger houses than others. Some of us have more money than others. But it's not how much you have. It's what you do or what you have. Amen? You could be like the widow woman who just put a mite in, but it was everything she had in honor and glorify God. She did more and better than the wealthy man who put his $50,000 in. Amen? Second thing, the hyper-grace message. It says grace gives us the license to sin. The Apostle Paul wrote, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may rebound? Make a change, it's Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Not 1, verses 1 and 2. And so, the hyper-grace message says, forget the law, forget the word of God. God will forgive me. He's already forgiven me. And so, therefore, I can go out and do what I want to. That will not work. That's wrong. Paul corrected that in Romans 6. He says, we don't use grace as a license to sin. Because of the grace of God, he gives us power over sin. He gives the freedom from sin, not the power or the will to sin, but gives us the power over sin. Amen? I don't want to get up in the morning. You don't want to get in the morning and say, I want to go out and sin today because I know God will forgive me. I've had people tell me that. Pastor Baker, I know what the word says. I hear what you're saying, but you know what? I don't want to do that. I want to do what I want to. You know what I said to them? Well, go to hell. <laughs> That's what, they, what they're saying. I remember talking to a very wealthy man in Atlanta. He said, I know what the Bible says. 
for rich men to enter the kingdom of God because it's difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom. But you know what? I don't want to sell my houses, my land, and cash in all my stocks and bonds and give it to the poor. I want to keep it. So what you're saying to me, sir, is you want to forfeit eternity for, what, 60 or 70 years here on the planet. That is a smart thing to do. Here's what I believe. If you're willing to give everything to God, he'll let you keep it and add more to it so you can be a blessing to the kingdom. The purpose of money is God wants you to be blessed, to bless others, and bless the kingdom. Amen? Not to be self-indulgent. Amen? Third thing, antinomianism. The book of 1 John was written to deal with this heresy, which was way back then, which is a false teaching in the church today. Antinomianism means against the law. Forget the law. Just toss it aside. Anything goes since Jesus set us free. Kind of a little bit of spinoff on the hyper grace. I'm not falling into your religious legalistic religion. Jesus set me free. The problem is that Jesus didn't set us free to sin. He set us free from sin. Once again, Romans chapter 6 says and deals with this false teaching. Here's what we understand from the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 10. That what happens, we come into a new covenant with Jesus Christ. Instead of writing the law on tablets of stone, he writes his law on a heart. He writes his law. He doesn't do away with the Ten Commandments. The law is holy. The law is righteous. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. There's a balance in grace and the law. Law keeps us from moving into sin. Law gives us the knowledge of sin. Eight, do not covet thy neighbor's wife. Do not steal. Do not lie. Honor thy mother and father. Don't make any false images. Don't take God's name in vain. The list goes on and on. Those are the Ten Commandments and the other commandments of God. But because of the goodness of Jesus Christ, because of the fact of the grace of God, I want to keep the law of God. His words, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Amen? So we need the law of God to help us stay on the straight and narrow that we don't wander off. Amen? You take the law away, you have anarchy. So when you read the book of 1 John in the first chapter, it says, if we say we have not sinned, then we call God a liar. We say there's no sin in our heart and life, then we're a liar. And so, it's important that we have this balance in our lives. Amen? The fourth thing, the deification of man is a false teaching whereby man is lifted up to a place of God. This teaching starts with man rather than God and basically says that Jesus came to make us into a bigger and better you. Just a positive mental expression or teaching. This is not the gospel. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about him. Amen? The gospel is this, and I mentioned it already, found in Matthew 16, 24. Also comes to my mind, Luke chapter 9, verse 28. You deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You decrease that he might increase. Can you say amen? It's not a deification of man. We deify God. He's God. Amen? And so what we want, what we believe is for the truth of the gospel to be preached, not preaching a doctrine that says, well, if you want to follow Jesus, you come to Jesus, and what's going to happen is he's going to make you blessed. He's going to make you this and that. Yes, I know I've been blessed. Amen? But the premier thing in my life and your life is not about me. It's about him. Put God first, and you know what? You'll have joy. Jesus first, others second, you last. J-O-Y. Jesus, others, you. Amen? And he goes on and says so many times, if you honor God, the last shall be first. Meaning, I get back and honor and prefer others then you really will be first. That's the character quality of Jesus. 
Did he put others? He said, I've come not to be ministered unto, but to be a minister and give my life a ransom for many. That's the example, amen? That goes against human nature. Our human nature is self-indulgent, self-preservation, all about taking care of ourselves. But when you come to Christ, you die that he might live, and then you really know what it means to be prosperous. Can you say amen? The fifth thing, challenging the authority of God's word. Best-selling authors say that the Bible text is unreliable. Manuscripts are hopelessly contradictory. And scriptures are nothing more than a collection of religious traditions. I've heard people say this. I know of seminaries in the Northeast that teach this. They don't believe in the resurrection. Jonah and a whale, ha! Oh, just a fabrication. The Red Sea parting never happened. I remember sitting in seminary, he said the Red Sea was only six inches deep. That's why they were able to cross it. I said, well, how did the Pharaoh and his army drown in six inches of water? I don't know. They called it not the Red Sea, they called it the Reed Sea because reeds were growing up, so it wasn't that deep. Baloney. If you start questioning those miracles in the Old Testament, you're going to question the quintessence of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We've got to stay true to the word of God. They say things like this. They say they love God. Well, well uh, you know, here's the point in case. The pro-homosexual reading of the scripture. They say they love God. They seem to be Christ-like. They're devoted to each other as a couple and pray in the spirit. Listen, who changed the truth of God's word into a lie? Now, understand something about me, okay? Anyone can come through that door. You can come through that door with a ring in your nose, pink hair, no shoes. You could be homosexual, you could be agnostic, you could be atheistic. I don't care where you came from. I'm concerned about where you're going. I love people. Do I talk to people who aren't believers? I'm delighted. I've even gone into a bar where they're all unbelievers. Not to get a beer. I got a glass of whiskey instead. <laughs> I, know, I was up in a little town in Andover, New York, and I was up. My buddy's up there because his wife was dying of Lou Gehrig's disease. I did lead her to Jesus, led him to Jesus. I ran that day from his hunting lodge up in the mountains down the dirt road six miles to uh, Andover. Went into the bar to get a cold <laughs> glass of water. Because I was thirsty, I was dehydrated. And those people in that bar knew that I was the Rev. Interesting, they honored me. When that dear lady died, they all came to the funeral, that small town, which was founded before the Revolutionary War. Packed out the first Baptist church. They were standing outside. I preached the gospel that day. Those people in the bar who knew I didn't condone their drinking, their behavior, their lifestyle, but they knew I loved them as a person. And because of that, they said, Pastor Baker, you didn't judge us. So they opened their heart. I preached the gospel. And when I gave the invitation, just about everybody in that building raised their hand to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, I could have come in there and been religious, said, you know, I'm not going to step foot in this place. I'm not going to have anything to do with you people. I'm not going to talk to you because you're an unbeliever. The love of God will cover a multitude of sins. You reach people by showing acts of kindness and loving them, not judging them. Don't condone their behavior. Don't accept that. You walk a holy life. You set an example. You open the door and because of that, I've had the privilege of leading several people. They even went to high school with. 
to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus. At the funeral, I said, this dear lady who's laying here in a casket, her body, she is not present here. She did not live her life for God. She was a party animal. She lived for herself. She made a lot of money, had a lot of friends, but she was, as far as the things of God, she was broke. She was poor. But God had mercy on her, and God visited her in the midst of her illness and her misery. He saved her and redeemed her, and she's in the presence of God. Nobody here wants to go to hell and then hell be cast into the lake of fire. You need Jesus as your Lord and Savior. My prayer is that her life will be a seed that's fallen into the ground that it will bring forth life and fruit. And this will be a testimony. As a result, God will touch your heart and you will change. And then gave the invitation. Amen? Sixth thing. There is no future punishment. This message of preaching unbalanced gospel, the teaching emphasizes God's love and ignores his wrath, emphasizes mercy, ignores his justice. The conclusion is there's no place for hell and future punishment in our theology. Jesus said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God shall abide upon him. It's clear. There's a God, there's a devil, there's a heaven, there's a hell, there's a plus, a minus. Amen? And I tell people, don't fear him who can kill you, deceive you, or that. Fear him who can take you and cast you into eternal damnation. The devil doesn't have that power, but God is a righteous judge. I fear God more than I fear the devil. Because the devil is a singular, limited being. He's not omnipotent, not omnipresent. He's not all-knowing either. He's limited. He's defeated. To the triumphant victory of Christ on the cross who came out of the grave. Amen? Now, God, because he's a just God, will not contend with letting sin and ungodliness into his kingdom. But he's come not to destroy us. He's come to redeem us. Amen? Amen? But there is a hell and there is a lake of fire. It was initially designed for those who rebelled against God in heaven who were cast down. And a portion of those angels, fallen angels, are cast into hell. But if a person rejects the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, there's no more forgiveness of sins because they do the unpardonable sin, reject the convicting power of the Holy Spirit who speaks to us and convicts us of a sin, the truth of righteousness and eternal damnation. If you don't tell people that there's such a thing as the second death in the lake of fire and tell them that it never happened to you. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one can come to the Father but by me. That's the only way. All roads don't lead to the same place. There's only one road that leads to heaven. That's through Christ. Amen? A final thing, universal reconciliation. I've heard this being taught. Belief that in the end everyone will make it into heaven because in Adam all die, but in Jesus all live. Therefore, Jesus has come. We're all going to live, all going to go to heaven. No matter what you believe. Kind of falls into what we call postmodernism, where people don't believe in anything. Truth is what I determine truth to be. There's no right and wrong. I'll determine what's right and wrong. If I want to stop at red light, I'll stop. If I don't, I won't. I make my own laws. Because it doesn't really matter because in the end, God's going to have mercy and take everyone to heaven. If that's true, then why, what, am I, what am I doing here today? Let's do like that country singer does, get that red cup. Let's have a party. Let's have a party. And a little... You have a party. I mean, you know, it is a, there's no reason for us to live a godly life if we don't have to be accountable for what we live and do and what we say. There is God's way, which is the true way, the way of life. Can you say amen? Once again, I repeat that scripture. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. 
If you see or hear anything of this nature, I'm not part of that. I'm not supporting that. I'm not financing that. I don't have anything to do with that. I want to stay in the way, in the truth. Can you say amen?